is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Veronica Mars, season three, episode thirteen, post game mortem. In this episode, well, Wallace's coach is dead. And I really want to blame this kid that Wallace seems to be sort of outshining. But I can't understand why he would do this. And what is the connection with the Dean? Because it feels like there must be one. What is happening? Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Ariel for commissioning this episode. Ariel is in the chat right now. Ariel, am I saying your name right? Is it Ariel? Is it Ar- Ariel? Is there, a, is there a lilt at the end there? First is right. Ariel. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for commissioning this. So <laughs> just a FYI, you guys, on the um, drop down for on Crowdcast for like what's upcoming. I still have to add in the, um, the live watch, uh, because apparently y'all wanted me to do a live watch of episode 15. So I haven't updated the scheduling on here for it yet, but I will. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, so this episode, this is like kind of a packed one, which is sort of weird considering how much of it is just hanging out with Logan. Who's depressed I really, like, the thing for me about the Logan is depressed bit, it's frustrating because I actually really liked this, like, plot line, and I thought it was fun to watch, and I was just sort of invested in it, but I don't like that, what I, what the takeaway is for me is we're getting a lot of Logan, because he's not going away. Like, if it were another character that we were seeing this sort of thing with, then it would just kind of feel like maybe this is going to tie in with the murder or something. But it's Logan. So it's just feeling like eventually, Veronica is going to like come to her senses, and she's gonna, you know, decide to take him back after all. And we're supposed to really feel sorry for him and see how much he's suffering so that we want her to take him back because we know that he's a good guy who really loves her. And I mean, you know, I don't really, I don't, I don't care. Like there's only so many things that you can fuck up that I am going to be able to get past it. And sleeping with Veronica's like sworn enemy really is just a bridge too far. And you weren't going to even tell her and you acted like it hadn't happened and she wasn't going to find out. And honestly, dude, you get what you get. You know, that's you, you're reaping what you sowed. And I'm, I'm just, it sucks. Breakups suck. I'm sorry you're depressed, but also that's no reason for her to have to cave and take you back. So that's out of the way. Um, I will say that I really did enjoy this bit with this little girl. It starts off with Dick, who uh, has met this girl that he is saying is so hot that he might need oven mitts to feel her up. Okay. (laughs) Dick, you charmer. And he promises Logan that she's got a sister that looks just like her. And when they show up, the sister's 11. And it turns into Logan babysitting for a whole weekend as Dick and this girl, whose name I'm forgetting, they go off to Vegas together and get married. I am dying to know what happens because it could easily be, okay, we're going to go and get divorced. But by the time they get back, it does not seem like they've gotten divorced by the end of the episode. So I don't know that that's what happened. And it would be pretty funny if there was like an ongoing thing How much money do the Casablancas have at this point? Can she take him for all he's worth? I am assuming, due to the spontaneous nature of this, that there was no prenup. 
And it would be amazing if now there was a subplot about Dick getting taken to the fucking cleaners and this girl just clearing his bank account out because guess what? You know, that'd be pretty fun, honestly. However, the whole thing with um, Logan and this little girl, and you guys remind me of what her name is. She is incredibly sunny and has this huge smile throughout a lot of this episode. And um, she reminds me a great deal of Owen's. Owen has a um, cousin who had three daughters and they all look really, really similar to one another. And this little girl looks like all of them. Uh, just a huge, wide smile, huge eyes, sort of strawberry blonde hair, and like really like tiny, you know, Heather. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and it's a great foil for Logan, because the way that we get introduced to him this episode is uh, the room service guys are outside his door getting very irritated at the fact that he doesn't want to let them in to take their other trays and stuff away. And he has been doing this for so many days in a row that they are running out of salt and pepper shakers, plates, probably like the covers that come with room service stuff. As somebody who used to do room service at a like resort hotel, there is a limited supply of a lot of that kind of thing. And uh, he is not sympathetic at all to their plight. So Dick comes in to the room, uh, lures Logan out onto the balcony by promising that there's a fire in Veronica's neighborhood that he can probably see from out there. And then locking him out there while the maids come in and clean, while the room service staff takes all of the other stuff away. It's just a massive disaster in the room. Clothes everywhere, old food. And what I always think of when I see a room like this, if you've stayed at a hotel, you know there is a curious quality to the air because they really try and keep each room sort of vacuum sealed from all the rest of the rooms. That way, should somebody be smoking in their room, it won't completely fuck things up for everybody else on the floor. If there is just in general sound or smells that could travel, they have constructed the place so as to not let it permeate if they can. It sort of reminds me of getting onto an airplane and that insulated vacuum sort of feeling. Not all hotels are like this, obviously, but a lot of them are. And it causes this weird sort of like stagnant air sometimes if they don't stay on top of that. And I can just imagine what it must smell like in Logan's room. It must be horrific. <laughs> um, and Lo uh, sorry, Dick, understandably, is kind of like, dude, we share this place. So if you look like a complete creep to these chicks, that's not going to be good for me. So please fucking clean up at least a little bit. Eventually, the girl shows up. She has Heather with her. They leave. Logan is ready to just be like, watch a movie and I'll take off and go to bed and it's fine. But he doesn't realize how long they're going to be gone. And that was key. This, this plot would not have worked if they had just been gone for the day. A few hours he can pass by being asleep or just avoiding her. No problem. A couple of days? That's just, you know, he's a nice enough guy that he wouldn't do that to a little girl and just completely, like, abandon her, you know? And um, she's so sort of understanding in her way at the fact that he's, like, going through something that I think that also breaks through. She's not being demanding of him and not acting resentful of the fact that she's been like left behind. And uh, have you guys ever gone through anything like this? You know, this is a weird thing because, you know, I don't have siblings. And so I have never really been in this sort of position. I know that this is a really common thing when you are a younger sibling, especially is that your older siblings want to go out and do shit. And you're sort of the like anchor around their ankle and they need to get rid of you in order to, you know, go out with their friends. And so you wind up being pawned off on people or left to your own devices when you really shouldn't have been because they want to experience life and you're too young to go with them wherever they're going to go or, you know, they just don't want you there. In my case, it wasn't really anything like this. It was more just like 
being with parents who didn't really like understand taking care of a kid yet. My dad just was like, he was involved in the drug trade. It was a bad scene. He didn't know what he was doing. And my mother was really, really young. And so occasionally I would be brought places with them. Like to, they would visit a friend and I would be just sort of like left. And it was never for this kind of length of time. It was never days at a time, you know, but there often was a sort of sensation of, they just trust I'll be fine in a real vague way, but they did not think through what I'm actually up to while they're not looking, you know? Um, and this just, it was sort of sad in its way, especially when you step back and consider the situation that it turns out Heather and her sister are in. We find out at the end that their father just walked out on them. And the way that Heather has been coping is sort of like overcompensating for her sadness by being really, really like upbeat and bouncy. And she's on Prozac also. And uh, it's interesting to find that out while her older sister is out running to Vegas and getting married to a random guy. Like clearly she's not coping super well with her dad leaving either. She's acting out in her own ways, but it just manifests really differently for both of them. Um, Ariel says my big sis was awesome and let me hang out with her and her friends a lot and was nice about it. So I don't really know. Rachel says I'm the youngest, but my siblings are all three to 10 years older and my parents didn't really use them as babysitters. So I don't remember being left anywhere. Okay. Yeah. It's a, you know, I, I don't think that this is by any means like a universal thing, but I have heard about it happening to people. Um, and I do think it, it also depends on like the relationship between you and your parents and whether your parents trusted your sibling, whether you like, you know, they're talking about how they didn't use their siblings as babysitters. And that can be a thing too. Like, do you have an actual dedicated babysitter? Can your parents afford to pay somebody to watch you? Because then they don't have to worry about it. I feel like this sort of thing tends to happen, tends to happen more in families where they don't have a lot of help. And so, the parent has begun like depending on the older sibling, maybe a little too much for child rearing purposes. And the older sibling begins to get resentful of it. And it's sort of like them pushing back and being like, this isn't my job. And they're right. It's not, you know, it's one of those things that I, I think about how much older siblings are, were often like expected to become the next head of the family sort of at a very young age, um, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, it was just sort of like, yeah, if you were the oldest daughter, you were mom number two, kind of. And what an unfortunate position that was to put a girl in. Um, Rachel says, my older sisters might have different memories than me. I should ask them. That's true. Um, you know, I could see too, if you were like sort of abandoned places, but you had a really good time. And so you just didn't see it that way at the time because you were just having fun. Um, so gradually, she sort of like lures Logan out of his shell. First thing she does is ask him to like set up the GameCube for her. And that gets them playing Mario Kart together. And uh, the this, you know, grows slowly. It, she talks about like her favorite ice cream place. And he's like, no, this other place is better. And she begins to sort of coax out of him the fact that he's upset about a girl, that he is still in love with her, which he doesn't say, but like she eventually when she says it and he gives her a look, she's like, it's really obvious. I don't know why you thought I wouldn't realize that's what was happening. But yeah, I can tell. Um, and she sort of gets it in her head that because Logan is still in love with Veronica, that means that they shouldn't split up. And it's so, it's so precious because like, yeah, when you've been fed this, this narrative your whole life that love conquers all, you really think that's all it takes. If you still love a person, then that's enough. And it's just not true. And that's okay. I think that's the part that gets lost is the idea that sometimes love isn't enough sounds sad and terrible and bleak. 
but it's not. It's mature. It's looking at the whole person rather than um, an emotion and an attachment. And it's okay to re- to still love somebody and walk away anyway. In fact, I would argue that's a very good situation to be in. If you walk away from somebody and you feel absolutely nothing for them anymore, you waited too long to walk away. Shit is bad, you know? But if you are still like, kind of like, man, this is hard. Maybe it should be hard. Maybe that's like the significance of what you had together. And that's how it should be. Um, You know, I mean, this is something that I've always talked about with Brendan. Brendan is a good person. We're not married anymore. We don't even speak anymore. But I believe that he's a good person who is trying his best in some ways. And I still care about him. It's, you know, it's just, it just didn't work. We did love each other, but it wasn't enough to make up for a lot of the problems in our relationship and the the ways that we took each other for granted or didn't see each other or didn't grow together in certain places, you know? So she winds up like calling this, um, this radio station and making a request and dedicating the song from Logan to Veronica. And (laughs) this is like a moment of Logan really restraining himself. He says like, I really wish that you hadn't done that. And when she argues with him that like being in love, but still breaking up is just stupid. He just reach for reaches forward and pats her on the head, even though it feels like he maybe kind of wants to strangle her. But later on, it goes a little bit too far because they actually run into Veronica on the elevator and she keeps trying to push him and say, like, tell her how you feel, tell her what's going on. And then when he won't make a move, she steps forward herself and is like, did you hear the radio? And tries to sort of initiate the thing. And he doesn't appreciate it. You know, she's she's acting like this whole thing is like a role playing game, you know, like she's just it's two pieces on a board that she's making uh, like pushing together and going now kiss. And it's the real people. And he did something that he hasn't told her about, which he doesn't have to, there's no reason for him to explain to this little girl exactly what happened. But um, it's, this is what actually winds up sort of pushing him over the edge. And he yells at her about how she's 11 and doesn't fucking know anything about love. And, when he finds out later about her father, he feels really bad because part of the accusation that he made here was that you are 11, you don't know anything, and it's easy to be happy all the time when you're 11 because he's taking her bubbliness at face value. And when he finds out about her father and her older sister is like, that's sort of her new thing. He realizes this is a coping mechanism and that Logan and Veronica were kind of the stand-ins for her parents for a minute there. And he just clearly feels like really bad about that. Um, So it ends with like the two of them making a standing date to like play uh, Mario Kart online with one another. It's really sweet, actually. And of course, within all of this is Dick getting married and then coming back and there being this like fight between him and her sister where he's making fun of her freakish toes. Um, But I really did like that the whole episode, as much as I was aware of the fact that Logan still being this predominant means he's likely to come back, there wasn't actually a resolution here. It wasn't like by the end, Veronica's like, never mind, I forgive you, which I was a little afraid that it would wrap up like that. It's solely about what's going on with him and this little girl, really. And she's gotten him to like come back to earth a bit where he was really mired in self-pity. And I mean, and when I say that, I'm not trying to downplay the effects of an actual depressive episode. But when it's something like this, it feels like there's a huge element of self-pity as well, you know? Um. So, all right, then let's bounce out of there and let's talk about what is going on with Wallace's basketball team. You guys are going to have to help me out with the names on this as well. 
Um, cause there is the kid that, uh, there's first of all the coach's name, the coach's son. And then there's the kid that Wallace keeps competing with f- to, for the starting position. And we find out like that the whole thing where Wallace is, uh, being given a starting position over his friend. Well, I say friend loosely. Um, <laughs> Rachel says, look, Wallace still exists. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, they just really haven't done much with him. Um, but he freely says later to Veronica that he doesn't feel like he's starting because he's better than this other kid. Mason. Thank you, Ariel. Um, Mason is just always butting heads with the coach. And so Wallace winds up starting because his attitude is just the two of them don't work well together. This is one of those things that I could see actually being down to, I mean, guys, help me out. Who was the guy who did the hit and run and then Wallace wound up and he had like a really powerful like uncle or something. And uh, that guy wanted Wallace to keep his mouth shut about it because I don't think it was Mason, right? Was it another kid? It's been so long now. If it is Mason, maybe the uncle's involved, but I don't think it, okay. It was a different guy. Says Rachel. Okay. I'm wondering if there's something going on here with like the um, mobster, basically guy who comes in and leans on the Dean. He's sort of acting like, well, I wanted him fired, not killed, but fired's fine. I mean, but killed is fine if that gets it done. I feel like there's a sort of casualness to the way he speaks here that makes it seem like he's really not somebody to worry about. But I think that's that dude has something to do with it. That said, I posited in my intro that I feel like there is a connection between this coach's death and what happened with the Dean. And I can't imagine what that connection could be. I just really don't like, was there somebody getting paid off and both of them found out about it? Like, because, you know, college basketball is no joke. College basketball and college football are these weird industries where the students don't fucking make any money off of it, but the school can make an absolute fortune and they are corrupt as hell. Honestly, sports in general are just to me, a cesspool, like the, the whole thing surrounding sports and the way they work. It's so exploitative. It's so unfair. Um, so there could very well be something that was going on that involved all of them and, somehow the Dean was just the first one to get got, but there might be like a list of people who are all figuring shit out, you know? Um, I don't feel like we've met the coach before, so I can't speak to anything about his like involvement specifically or what he would and wouldn't have done because we really don't get a huge sense of him this episode beyond the fact that he is really hard on his son. And eventually we see that the son quits the team And it's sort of like hinted at by Josh himself that while his father like wanted the best for him, he was incredibly like overbearing and obviously had a little bit of that toxic masculinity thing going on where he was just like, you know, pull, pull yourself up and get it done. What the fuck? Be a man. And there's a part of me that is really thinking Josh did kill his own dad just because that would be a fun twist. He's so convincingly pathetic in this episode. But I don't know. I'm very curious too about, but in the end, he gets out of jail. He escapes. And Veronica winds up being arrested for aiding and abetting his escape. And you know, we know that she brought him a book that had been hollowed out full of cookies, which I mean, that is the oldest trick in the book. Who checked this stuff when she brought it in? God damn. 
I'm assuming they found a book that had a hole in it. They knew she brought it. The cookies were gone. And they were like, well, he obviously escaped via using something that she put inside the book. But there is sort of a weird moment when he opens it and finds the cookies inside. And he starts eating and he glances up at the dude on the bunk above him and then keeps eating. And there's like this moment to me, this dude's watching him going like, hey, why don't you give me one of them cookies? And he's disinclined to acquiesce to his request. I don't know if that's meaningful or not. I will say personally, the way that dude was looking at him really felt to me like he was asking for some cookies. But, and so the fact that Josh chooses not to give him any felt also significant. Like we were just seeing like, ah, he's a little bit of a selfish dick. Okay. Uh, At the same time, I cannot emphasize enough to you guys how much I don't share food. I don't like it. If I make food, everybody gets some and I don't even mind not having any. That's not true. I do mind not having any, but I will go with the smallest portion on behalf of my guests. But if I get given something, you better not try and take that shit away from me, my friend. You're going to lose a hand. You're going to lose something. So uh, I don't know if it's meant to be a, you know, sort of comment on his character, but I wasn't that mad at him about it. It just seemed a tiny bit rude. Um, so anyway, um, the whole thing with his father, it's very sudden. And it's interesting because we don't actually see any of what happened. The show tends to, other than with Lily's death, which had happened already by the time we started the show, we don't get to see any of the events surrounding her death or the actual, like, because allegedly, first of all, nobody was there to see her die. She was just found. So there was that factor, but also it had happened months earlier. Since then though, when something has happened to people, we have tended to watch along And we might not be given all the information to understand fully the context of what's happening, but we're aware something's going on with this person and that they're hurt or they've been killed. And it's interesting with the coach that we aren't given anything. All we're given is the next day when there's this like, you know, meeting about it because his family comes to see Keith and asks him to investigate And they are explaining to him basically their theory on what happened. And they think he was the victim of a carjacking and that they, somebody jumped him and his car was stolen. They, do they have his body? Because I assume they do because they are going with the fact that the guy, like they're, they've stated that he's dead and that it was a gunshot, if I'm not mistaken. But the car is missing, and that's what leads the family to thinking that it was a car jacking. Eventually, we have this moment where Veronica goes and investigates the scene herself, and she winds up finding tire tracks that go over the edge. And it's suggested that likely the car went over, and that sort of rules out that it was a carjacker. Um this is one of those things that's always so frustrating. And I'm just like, okay, they didn't notice this. The like professionals who investigated the scene didn't see these giant tire tracks going up to the edge. Okay. But it's fine because honestly the police suck. So it's, that's like the least of my worries. Um, so also she had gone to uh weevil and asked him to find the PCHers and the dude who's in charge now is the one who had been like robbing pizza guys And she asks for a meeting because she's trying to assess out whether or not they are behind this because they do carjackings, you know, and they turn over the car and sell them. And she's waiting to see them. And Weevil's sort of mocking the fact that she seems so nervous. But she points out, like, honestly, I kind of want Josh to, like, not be the guy. And if they fail to show up, I'm going to feel pretty confident they're guilty. And therefore, I would like it if they don't show. So when they do roll up, it's a bit of a bummer for her because this means that she has to keep 
looking and keep digging. And uh, I love this kid who is in charge of the PCHers now because when she is talking to him about this case, he's like, all right, first of all, that guy owned like an eight year old station wagon that would be worth fucking nothing. So that is not the kind of car we steal. Second of all, apparently he got like held at gunpoint. That is not what we fucking do. We put a nail in a board on the road to give someone a flat. So they have to pull over and change their tire. And we jump them as they're getting up from changing the tire. It's a, you know, the whole thing is a trick and a setup. We don't just like go aggro on people. And half the time, they're so frightened when they look up and see us standing around them, they give us the keys and we don't even have to do anything. And then finishes off his whole thing with like, and I hope you catch them because this is really fucking my business up, which I bet it is. If the police think it's them, they're all up their ass, you know? Um, so Veronica has to keep pressing now that it seems very convincing to her, like this argument, you know, it's uh, ringing true. So she and she's also like talking to Wallace about everything and the idea that it's Mason, like Wallace doesn't seem to buy that himself. There's a real sense to Wallace of guilt um, because he, I think, feels like he stepped in and managed to get given preference over a player that might actually be better than him simply due to the fact that he doesn't have the attitude problem. And it's an interesting conundrum because like, I understand that feeling. If you've ever been on the receiving end of preferential treatment, it's sort of a, an odd sensation when you simultaneously sort of understand why you're getting it, but don't feel like it's right. And uh, because sometimes you get preferential treatment and it's just because you're the most competent one and you're the one trying the hardest. And you're like, yeah, well, they just clearly like me better because I give a shit. With Wallace, it's like a a subtler thing. The, The reasoning for it isn't necessarily anything to do with the actual sport they're here to play. So he feels a little bit away about it, you know, and I understand that. Um, so when she goes to Josh to talk about this, because he eventually gets arrested because Mason goes to the cops and tells them that he saw Josh and his father fighting on the side of the highway, having an argument. And I don't remember if he says specifically that Josh pulled a gun. I don't remember if he says that, but it's just the circumstances of seeing the two of them fighting on the side of the road where the body was found looks bad and they go and arrest Josh right away. By the time Veronica uh, gets back from her little uh, road trip out with Josh, the cops are at his house waiting for him. Um, I'm trying to find the spot too, because I'm, I don't even remember what she took him out to do. Um, but he, cause he, Josh is with her for a part of the day before he winds up getting put in jail. But the whole thing feels so circumstantial and yet we know how the law can work and that it being circumstantial is, you know, absolutely enough sometimes, especially Sheriff Lamb, like just straight up does not give a fuck. You know, he's just willing to go with the very first piece of evidence that presents itself. And she, he, he's sort of lazy, just straight up, you know, let's be honest. Um, so, when Josh gets thrown in jail, Veronica is in this weird position where she has to decide whether she believes him and she has to pretend at least for now that she does believe him so that he will keep trusting her and telling her information. And it's interesting because like, I really get the sense that she doesn't want him to be guilty. And I can't tell if it's because she likes Josh as a person or because just the idea of like a son killing his own dad just fucks her up. Um, Oh, that's right. They go off to look at the like site of the crash. That's right. Um, And when they look over the side, by the way, I wasn't really clear. He accepts that the car went over, but the, the way the camera keeps focusing down into the water made me feel like I was supposed to be seeing something and I didn't. 
Uh, do they actually find his car in there? Or is this just the hypothesis that they've decided to go with because of the tracks? Um, either way, you know, they, they have both sort of settled that that's probably what happened. So when she tells him about Mason's accusation, she's like, does this make any sense to you? Like, would does Mason have a grudge against you that he would want people thinking that you did this? Like, what's the deal between you two? And Josh seems truly bewildered. And it's just like, I don't like, as far as I knew, he was pissed at my dad. I don't think that he had anything against me. I don't really get it. And she seems to also believe that. But you know, he could just be an excellent liar. There might be a whole little subtler thing going on here. Um, and then he tells her that Mason has a gun and that like at a party or something, he was like taking it out and brandishing it and showing it off. And that he went to the like, uh, sheriff and told him and that nobody believed him. And it was sort of a weird story. I'm, I'm like, why exactly did you go to the sheriff and tell him? Are you, do you mean that you told him when your dad turned up dead that Mason had a gun? Or are you saying that you tried to report that Mason had a gun, period? Because, like, you don't know whether or not that's an illegal firearm. He may own that legally. You know, he's of uh, he's of age, as far as I know. Over 18, you can own a gun. I, you know, correct me if I'm mistaken. So that honestly was, like, the first thing in his story that sort of gave me pause and made me be like, is this guy, like, fucking are like making shit up what's going on here that said the kid who's playing mason really comes across as fucking suspect to me and it could just be that he's cast that way it could just be that he's a bit of a dickhead and so we always see a dickhead and we're just like yeah you did some shit but i can't help but think he's up to something whether or not he actually killed the coach i feel like he knows who killed the coach or he knows what's going on in general. And I don't know, maybe like, I don't know. I, I still think that there's some like corruption going on with the, the games themselves somehow. But the fact that he wasn't starting makes me like, feel like he couldn't have been cooperating. Like the, either he, uh, either he Mason wasn't cooperating which could be it or the coach wasn't cooperating. And I feel like that sounds more likely to me. Maybe Mason was supposed to be in on a thing and the coach was supposed to start him. And he just didn't do that the way that the agreement dictated. I don't know, but there's just, there is a feeling to me that Mason is involved in a greater scheme that's happening, you know? Um, so yeah, Veronica winds up baking these cookies in an effort to try and make like she believes in Josh and smuggles them in. We see him eating them and he's sharing a uh, a cell with this older guy who doesn't ring any bells for me. I don't recognize him. I'm not sure if we're supposed to or not. Um, and he... Uh, <laughs> he just turns up missing by the end of the episode and she gets arrested for collusion. And I am dying to find out exactly how he got out of there because this police precinct is just the most embarrassing in the entire universe. Like I can't get over the fact that Sheriff Lamb is still in charge after all of his fuck ups. He's going to have to be like, there's, they're going to have to do a recall election. Something's going to happen like this dude, come on. I want Keith to run against him again. Um, so, all right. Speaking of Keith, let's back up. So he has been hired for that first investigation with the coach, but he is also still working on the thing with uh, the Dean. And, you know, last episode we had the whole thing where he finds the eggshell on the, uh, the windshield of the car, like under the wiper. And there's been some confusion over which car the Dean had with him that night, because the girl who egged the car said that she egged the Volvo 
But his wife has been insisting, no, I had the Volvo, he had the minivan. And what it looks like is that, and and it's weird to me that he's not seeming to like go this route. I mean, I guess it's Occam's razor. Again, you want to pick the like most obvious explanation. But he really seems certain that because her car vanished and she didn't watch Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, that me and I'll explain all of that in a sec, but that means that she was the one who went and killed her husband. And I just, I'm like, man, she wouldn't have been, she would have been pushing back on you looking into this like particular aspect of things much sooner if she was at all worried you were about to stumble on onto something. And she isn't. She's trying to work with you and give you explanations as to why, you know, she called, what's his name? I can't remember the name of the um, the criminology professor, but there's a phone call from her phone to his at like one thirty in the morning. And Keith asks her, what's the deal with that? Because you guys allegedly were together the whole night. So why would you have to call him? And she tells him about how she like went out to get some toothpaste from like the lobby and was calling him to see what kind he wanted. And when Keith calls Professor Landry, thank you, Rachel, um, Professor Landry gives the exact same explanation of what happened. The thing is, Professor Landry can be give- corroborating her story, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he was still in the room when he took her a call. That said, if you just go down to the lobby and back up to the room again, that's not a whole lot of time. It doesn't sound like she left. So I don't really feel like Landry went and did some shit because there wasn't time for him to do too much. I don't know if he was trying to set her up and maybe give like, you know, he got her keys out of her purse and handed them off to somebody that perhaps could have happened. And he's answering the call and is able to like give her an alibi, but, or not even an alibi, but you know, just an explanation for this. Um, but why would he want to do that? What exactly? The thing that, that makes me feel like Landry is involved somehow is his insistence that the Dean killed himself because we know from Veronica, she wrote a paper about like basically how to get away with murder. And it was this scenario, right? Like a lot of it was the same. And she mentioned that to her father. I can't imagine that Professor Landry, who read and graded these papers, said hers was like the best in the class and posted it for people to read as a like lesson that he doesn't see the parallels there. And if he does then why would he keep like beating on the he killed himself drum? And if he doesn't, then he's bad at his job or he's like in denial or actively trying to dissuade because he's the one responsible. Um, guys, remind me, does Keith know about the fact that the Dean came to the hotel and confronted Professor Landry and his wife, because there's the fight that the, um, this is something Veronica winds up going to the hotel in order to get some information because her father has connections to some of the security in the hotel. And, but he can't get into like the, uh, registrations and charges to rooms under whatever names. So he sends her over there to do a bit of recon. And she is, you know, sort of friendly with the girl at the front be because of Logan and this girl is the one who tells her, oh, yeah, there was a like room charge for a movie. It was Kiss Kiss Bang Bang at this time of night. And that's what Veronica uses later to sort of try and trip Professor Landry up. She sort of attempts to quiz him in a subtle way about the movie and see if he's seen it. And he says yes. Well, he doesn't say yes, but he like responds to her statement with a correction about what actually happened in the movie. And she takes that as, you know, basically he saw it, which likely means he did stay in the room for the duration of the movie. 
I am very curious whether that's going to turn out to be anything. Because if he doesn't know that's what she's looking at, then probably that is the simplest explanation. But if he is aware that he's going to come under scrutiny in this way, I would be the person, at least, if because uh, I'm such a planner, I would order the movie, go commit my crime, and then watch it later. Or I'd pick a movie I already really knew well and had seen a bunch of times so that I didn't have to even think about, you know, whether or not I remembered certain plot points or whatever. Um, so... Yeah, the, just the fact that he keeps on trying to be like, he committed suicide. It just doesn't fit who this guy is. He he teaches criminology. You know, this is his whole fucking, there is no reason to believe that the way this went down is what it looks like. And the fact that he's willing to take it at face value just feels completely out of character to me. And yet, I can't figure out what the connection would be if I'm going to go like, why would he have killed the Dean? Was he afraid of losing his own job? I don't know if that could have happened. I mean, I, I don't know if that was something that he even had to worry about. Um, And even if he was like, is losing your job something he'd kill over? I mean, that feels pretty extreme. Is he, like involved in whatever this like weird scheme is that I'm thinking of with that's involving the basketball team. Maybe, but I don't know how that could work. Um, and you know, the fact that it's Veronica's paper, it really feels like it ties him to everything that went down, but that could also be a sort of like misdirection. He also has the TA who we know saw Veronica's paper. Um, and we've been sort of dancing around that dude for a little while now. And we had that whole episode where the girl was pregnant and he knew that he wasn't the father, but was still being like really supportive of her pregnancy and like trying to help. And I think that was supposed to establish to us that he is like a decent guy who wants to do the right thing which is supposed to take him off our radar a little bit. And I'm not sure that actually has happened because he has just seemed like kind of a shit the few times that we've met him and really openly hostile to Veronica for no reason other than the fact that he's threatened by her. So, you know, I'm not hugely in the, I, I could see him using her paper as a means of, you know, killing this dude and trying to get away with it. That said, using her paper, when both of them are so close to the, like, class, that, you know, they, they are the ones who are sort of in charge, feels incriminating in a way that neither of them would be likely to to mistakenly, like, lean into. And as I said earlier, the professor was using her paper as, like, a case study of a great paper and posted it for everyone to read. So I'm focusing on those two, but I really shouldn't be because anybody had access to this idea, this concept, you know, and that opens it up to potentially the school because even you could say like the whole class, but I don't know, like if the message board is protected in any way, it could just be something that anybody could have gone and read and seen um, so either somebody was just doing it because they don't have much imagination and they were just copying an idea, or they could be doing it because they're trying to make it look like it was Professor Landry or they're trying to make it look like it was his TA or something. Um, yeah. So this whole thing with her, um, her, well, first I'll, let me talk about the, the guy who was doing the room service he says to Veronica that he came up with creme brulee 
and he t- heard two men arguing. It's one of those things, man. He's talking to her and he's like, I came back later and there and a woman answered the door and she's like, was it the same woman that was fighting? And he says, no. And she says, how do you know? And he says, because the voices were men. I'm like, how about you just tell her I heard two men arguing? Why do you have to fucking be like this so that she has to pull every fucking detail out of you like she's pulling teeth? Tell her what fucking happened. Okay, knock it off. But the fact that it's two men arguing is part of why I want to know whether Keith is aware that the Dean actually went to their room because that I don't think has come up in the conversation between him and the Dean's wife, whose name I'm also forgetting. And I feel like it would, I feel like the fact that he came to their room and confronted them would be a topic of conversation that would have been brought up more than once by now. And the fact that it's, just not mentioned in any of these conversations leads me to believe that he doesn't know. And if he doesn't, that's a really weird thing for her to not have told him, which feels really suspect in and of itself. Why wouldn't you let him know that there was this confrontation? The the one thing that's sort of saving her is that the hotel doesn't hold on to uh, security camera footage for that long. So there's no way to go back into the archives and see if indeed she just like came off the elevator and went straight to the little like, you know, general store and grabbed a toothpaste and then left. I have to wonder if like she went downstairs and there was something else going like, it's hard because I want to say something else was happening, but the story that she tells lines up so well with the story that Landry tells about the toothpaste that either they rehearsed that, which is certainly possible, but it seems unlikely that she would have like seen it coming that Keith would go that deep into their information, but maybe she did. So they could have rehearsed it. Um, or it actually happened and, was the delivery of the creme brulee supposed to be during the time that she was downstairs? Or maybe it was like, you know, maybe these two guys were arguing and she wasn't injecting herself into the conversation. And that's why the guy only heard them too. That doesn't sound right though. She's not the type to just sit by and watch those two argue with each other. And I don't think the Dean would have just yelled at the man involved. He would have been just as angry at her. And you know, she would have yelled back at him like, ah, I don't know. Um, Mindy, thank you, Rachel. And Rachel says that she's trying to remember, but also doesn't recall. All right. So I'm going to say that he doesn't know. And if not, is it possible? Well, no, because it gets returned. I was going to say, is it possible that the Dean like takes his Volvo back to go back to the the campus with and is sort of like I took the fucking you know stupid van today because I was running family errands and fuck you I want my nice car you can deal with the family errands because you're in the doghouse but the car gets brought back and Mindy sort of seems unaware that it was ever gone if we are to believe her story it seems to me her reaction to Keith telling her that the car was checked out is, is genuine. I don't think that she is lying. I think she really had no idea that it was taken and her reaction. Then somebody is trying to frame me feels on point. Like either they were trying to frame her or they're just straight up trying to confuse the situation so badly that it adds too many factors into the soup and nobody can figure it out. It's just maybe just meant to, you know, create chaos perhaps which can be really effective, just throwing like, you know, red herrings around and seeing what thing the cops mistakenly focus on for too long. Um, But I feel like if we're going to, to frame her, there would be more to it. I, it doesn't feel complete. You know, I feel like if we're, if we're actively trying to frame her specifically, 
you could do any other number of things to sort of place her at the scene, leave a glass with like lipstick on it or something. I mean, I don't know. Um, something to, to indicate that she was in the car. And not only that, but when he goes, when Keith goes and t- t- takes a look at the car, he finds the eggshell under a wiper, but it appears that the person took the car through a washer and brought it back clean. So she didn't even notice anything. And that's an extra bit of effort that's really like peculiar as well. Um, and it just doesn't really feel like, you know, I keep on pointing out this sort of, uh, I can't, I don't, I want to call him a mobster, even though that's not like his actual deal. But it feels like something that a sneaky individual would do, not somebody who's into like an organized crime would do. So that's the other thing that's sort of hanging me up here is I just don't really understand the motivation behind doing something like that. If you're not going to take the additional steps to make her look guilty, it's you wouldn't frame somebody, but also make the death look like a suicide. You know, you would frame somebody for a murder. And if you wanted to make it like suspicious enough you'd clearly have to be more obvious than this because the police fell for the, oh, it was suicide thing out of the gate. So I don't know, maybe they just overestimated how smart the police were or that they weren't trying to frame anybody. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I have a lot of questions here. Um, I'm trying to think because like th- when Keith eventually has like this confrontation with her, um, she gets really agitated And at first there's a bit of like, when, when it's clear that he, that he's sort of looking into her and Landry, she pushes back a bit, but then when he confirms her story about the toothpaste, she seems to give him a vote of confidence and is like, well, I appreciate the fact that, you know, you're digging in the wrong place, but you're clearly putting in the effort and looking through the data. And that's what I asked for. So that's good. So I want to keep you. But it definitely isn't me. And then later on, as shit begins to like, look worse for her, she really panics and just tells him you're off the case. And Keith's reaction, which I think is great, is that's really cute. But no, you can't do that. You don't take me off the case. You can fire me. But I actually liked your husband. So I'm going to pursue this anyway. So lol. Sorry. And I really liked that. Actually, I feel a bit bad for her. Because I want to get to the bottom of this. And I really feel like she also does. You know, I feel like there's something in her that it's more than just about the money. And I have no doubt that the money is a factor. But uh, I don't know. I just I this moment of her just being like, well, you're fired. Girl, that doesn't look good for you, first of all. And second of all, if you didn't do it, you don't I don't think that you have anything to worry about because whomever tried to frame you. It doesn't look like they did it too, like they worked too hard at it. Why would they frame you in such a way that only Keith picks up on it and not the police? So I feel like she's panicking because she's certain that this looks bad for her, but it does, it's not really going to be like that. And it looks worse to try and fire him instead of just letting him carry it out and be like, I don't know what happened, but I'm certain there's an explanation. Keep digging because you'll find it. And that makes you look a lot more reasonable. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much everything this episode, I think. Guys, I closed the chat and I can't figure out how to open it again. And I'm so sorry. I'm like trying to figure out how to do this now. Um, yeah, I don't know how to like reopen it. And there's no way for you to tell me because I can't see the chat where you're telling me. I'm so sorry. But I'm going to wrap up. It's good that that happened right at the end. Apologies, everybody. Um, 
I appreciate you very much, Ariel, for commissioning this episode. I hope you guys have been enjoying the coverage. And I will be seeing you all again pretty soon for a... Let's see, the next episode is 14, right? So yeah, that's going to be a regular one. And then after that is going to be the live watch. So uh, stay tuned for that. All right, guys, thank you again. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.